last years, last decades, we see more and more that the, that the trends which are facing new new member states are uh, are more global than the, than a question of the individual member states. So logically, that brings a question: What are the the gains to be made in more in this uh, intelligence cooperation between the EU member states? And, and especially also a principal question, what is the role of intelligence in that new security environment? Of course, that, that leads to many, many, when we start to take the practical aspect of that, it brings many questions. Of course, what is the, what are the, how to handle the fact that the EU, each and uh, every EU member states have their own traditions and also their own on interests and what how to handle those situations when when those interests are contradicting. What is the new the, the, the future the European intelligence community in the future and how it's organized? And also important, <coughs> what are the needs of the EU EU member states you know, or EU institution or needs of the EU institution in this context in the decision making, especially with all the uh, Treaty changes and all the new legislative powers that the EU institutions have, have gained. And related to that, always the question of democratic control and regulatory framework. <coughs> also, I think an interesting question is, especially after the crisis, uh, the NSA, uh, NSA crisis, I think the question is also what have the change, has there been a change in the, in the rules of the game? Or what are the new moral, moral nominators? Also, I think in this room, when, uh, when there was a discussion about uh, uh, the NSA uh, uh, incident, the Americans, uh, not maybe as a public uh, position, but uh, uh, in more, more or less public events, were saying that Europeans uh, should, should not be naive and said they should uh, understand or recognize that th this is the reality, that the intelligence uh, operations are taking place. So there, of course the question is whether after that incident the, the, the uh, different security services or intelligence services are more even requested to do more or, or even the, the, the expectations have been increased. And of course related to that, the, the very concrete questions uh, around us, developments in Russia. Um, there's a very intensive debate taking place on what what, what is uh, what are the Putin's next moves, and re related to that, was what is happening in Ukraine. Um, to deal with these questions, uh, we have very high level panel, which will be introduced by our deputy director Roland Freudestein. But before saying, giving uh, the product, we will also introduce our speakers. I would like to thank Ilka Sami, good friend of uh, already uh, since 20 years. And thank you very much for uh, coming, coming here and sharing, sharing with us your thoughts. But with these words, I would like to pass the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Toby, and welcome to everyone. Um, I have the honor and the privilege to moderate this debate. Uh, I will also introduce our speakers, but before that, I'd like to emphasize two things. Um, the event is being live streamed right here with the camera. So um, it's definitely on the record. Uh, second, I would like to encourage you to uh, tweet uh, during the event. Um, the, uh, 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 there's no particular hashtag, it's just at uh, Martin's Center. And um, if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to do us a big favor, please fill in the evaluation sheets at the end of the event and leave it with our reception desk outside. Now, having said that, I'd like to welcome um, particularly um, our two speakers. The third one is still coming. Her train is late. Um, Ilka Salmi is the um, has been the director of the EU Intelligence Analysis Center. And the acronym for that is INTSEN since 2011, and he has he can look back on a successful career in uh, uh, counterintelligence and uh, in the Finnish Security Intelligence Service, also the Ministry of the Interior and the Prime Minister's Office, where he worked as 
as an advisor. Dr. Christiane Hoen, right next to me, the advisor on counterterrorism issues to the EU counterterrorism coordinator, Jude Kekshaw, um, at the European <coughs> Council. And uh, she, she has a career as um, an expert uh, at uh, an expert at legal affairs. Uh, she was a researcher both in two very prestigious uh, institutions, the Max Planck Institute for International Law in Heidelberg and the uh, Center for Public Leadership at Harvard. Um, and she joined the Council of the European Union in 2004 and has been dealing with arms control and um, non proliferation uh, in earlier functions. So, thank you very much. Thank you both for coming here. I gather you both have prepared PowerPoint presentations. Um, so I'm uh, waiting for, uh, first of all, your presentation, Ilka, about what's, what's really, what are the, the issues on European intelligence cooperation in this time of crisis? Floor is yours. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor to be here and actually for an invention of the fact that it's web streamed and it's certainly on record is a bit of a strange issue. But then again, I mean, being a thing and having been in this business for 20 years, I don't think that I have received anything that I should have But anyway, I still hope that I can keep it interesting for you to, to discuss today the, the world of intelligence in the EU framework, especially. And uh, I will probably kick off by saying a few things. Um, that I always want to underline when it comes to the activities of EU. Itself. The first thing is, we are not an operational agency. We do not have intelligence operations anywhere in the world. We will rely on the contributions that we receive from the EU member states, and, and I will touch upon that at a later stage. So this is the point number one, which is, I would say, occasionally, at least even relatively frequently, mistaken in, in, in the Brussels environment. This means that we don't have any collection capability apart from the fact that we do receive some fantastic products by our colleagues in the EU SATS and the EU Satellite Center. But apart from that, we rely on member states, the EU delegations, and open sources in our, our assessment. And the third point, um, just as important in my view, is the fact that we do not have any right to collect personal data. So we don't operate like the member state services, we don't have have any, any files on anyone, any individual, and we focus on strategic intelligence instead of operational or practical intelligence in that sense. And indeed, I think Tommy already mentioned one thing, which, which is the legal, what's it, the legal framework. The Lisbon Treaty relatively clearly states that national security belongs to the competence of the member states. Then you could basically ask that, well, what do EU and intelligence have to do together? Interestingly enough, I would say all the member states do understand that there is a need for EU to have an intelligence component also in its decision making process. And this has actually been the case already since 2002, and it was already stated in the European Security Strategy 2003. I think the kind of starting point back then was the, the, the crisis in Balkans in the end of the 90s, and from there on, terrorist incidents, terrorist plots in Europe 2004. 2005 to name a few uh, points where we have <clears throat> really seen a change in the way uh, the member states also think and see the need for for our our support. I will now move quickly as, as I think that for many of you the, the entity EU Intent is not that familiar so I, I will run through very quickly how we are organized briefly but more importantly how we set our priorities and what does that mean then in basically how do we carry out the exact <coughs> one thing that I also need to underline is our very close cooperation with the EU military staff. The EU military staff has an intelligence director which is very similar to to EU INSEP. When we cooperate with the member states civilian intelligence agencies they do that the same thing with the military uh, or defense intelligence organizations. And we work together on a Brussels level, we pretty much share all our uh, intelligence, all our information, and the products that we produce are a joint effort. And, and that's exactly something which the, uh, our key customers, the high representative 
uh, Vice President Mrs. Mogherini and, and Lady Ashton before her insisted that that would be the way, way forward. It's a very straightforward organization. Those of you who have studied the organic gram of the External Action Service know that it's slightly complicated. This is not. We have two divisions within INSEN, the Analytical Division, Analysis Division, which is actually combined of, of seconded national experts from the member states, intelligence and security services. Roughly 40, uh, sorry, roughly 60% of my staff are seconded national experts from, from the services with a relatively long background in the intelligence business. While we do have also co colleagues with a with an, uh, commission or council secretariat uh, on, on, on their CV. The other, what we call the GERD division, which is the general and external relations, basically means open source intelligence. We have a small team dealing with publicly available information, and as has been very frequently said in the world of intelligence, probably 95 to 98 percent of, of information is somewhere out there available. You just have to dig deep and see what you, what you can figure out, and that's basically what that team is for. Um, uh, setting the priorities for, for the intelligence work within the external action service, and not only within the external action service, but also for the other EU institutions, namely Commission, the Council Secretariat, we, one of our key customers is the Council Terrorism Coordinator and, and, and his office, and we have a very close cooperation with, with the colleagues, and, and I'm sure that Christian will explain briefly the, also the, how, how we cooperate. Basically, I would just say that what we do, we try to provide let's say, the facts or the intelligence, and then it's for other people to come up with policy decisions and recommendations, and, and especially in the field of counterterrorism, that's Mr. Schildeberg's whole uh, responsibility. But setting the priorities, we have a kind of two, two layers. We have an intelligence steering board, which is chaired by the higher representative, and that's the ultimate body, which consists also of other key and, and top-level decision-makers on in, in the institutions, both the Commission, External Action Service, Mr. Schildeker called his member of that body as well. And that finally, for every six months, come up with what are those priorities, what are those topics that we have to follow. <coughs> it goes without saying that you know they are the hot, hot spots of the world, but they are also top issues related to countering terrorism. The working-level body beneath that is, is pretty much comprised of the same people, but on a lower level. And that's where uh, the, the, the working group is chaired by the director of intelligence director and myself, and we are the ones who come up with, with a draft, with a recommendation, how we see the world once we have consulted with the member states. What are those issues that might be a threat towards EU or EU's interests, or European citizens for those citizens for that? And, and of course, in that process, we always, of course, consult the high representatives' cabinet and, and the cabinets of other key decision makers before coming up with a bigger draft. What those priorities are, then, that's more of an, of an issue that, that some, of, some of those topics are very obvious, as you, as you would imagine. I mean, it goes without saying that situations in places like Syria, Iraq, and the foreign fighters issue are of, of, of high interest. Otherwise, it's, it's uh, it's certainly one of very classified documents that we have, but it got, you know, it, it, it's a no-brainer to, to understand that most of the things that you see in the, in the media and the news on a daily basis are certainly of great interest to us as well. And then on the implementation phase, uh, we have two, two entities, as I mentioned, our military, military colleagues and us who pro produced a one single document. The SIAC, I mean, especially our military colleagues love these abbreviations, stands for single intelligence analysis capacity it's just a virtual entity which basically means that we, we we do things together and there's one one product in the end apart from those which are linked to counter terrorism those are always produced by by and only that's the responsibility for for the civilian side so this is the basic production line and on the, on the planning and, and tasking phase, I'm really sorry, I mean, some of you, especially in the back, will, will, will not see what, what, what's there on the, on the board. But here are the, the, let's say, the key structures for, for coming, up the, coming up to the priorities and our working program. I will not go through every single phase how we, how we do things, 
But as I already mentioned, we always rely on the views and understanding of the member states and of course our own staff, what are the key issues. And then we produce what we call a six-month report of threat review, which is our own internal document, how we assess the world. Um, and one key issue that I also want to underline, we do not look into EU. We are, we are not focusing on any of the EU member states position or situation in, in, in any way. We always have an external dimension to our activities and that is the only exception being the uh, terrorism issues where, of course, together with the security services and our colleagues here in Brussels, we try to assess the threats that the terrorism poses to, to Europe. But otherwise, our interest is, is outside the EU. Um, and then another thing which, which I think is, 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 is of importance. We, once we have the priorities, we always work on a, on a six-month work program. And one thing which has certainly changed over the years, when I started back in 2011, I think that almost 80 to 90 percent of all our production were pre, kind of pre-programmed six months in advance, while the rest 10 percent were something where we tried to react to the events that took place. Today, the ratio is exactly the other way around. And I think this shows the, how, how much more, let's say, flexible we need to be in, in, in our activities and trying to uh, really react and hopefully be, let's say, even proactive in, 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 in some of the major crisis situations or uh, when, when, let's say, let's take as example the, the situation in Syria. And, and, and this is certainly which has been a very demanding task for us as we have to we have to still rely on the contributions from the member states so it always takes a while and time is of essence of course that goes without saying as I mentioned what we do it's an all source assessment so it's it's basically whatever we get our hands on we will use in, in our analysis and the unique role that has been already mentioned. This is exactly the, the situation with the member states, intelligence and security community. No other entity in the EU has such a direct links with all the member states services as we do. And I think this is also very well recognized by the services um, in the capitals that it's an the gateway or the point of contact when it comes to deal, to deal with, with, uh, with the institutions in general. And also, I'm relatively convinced today that also in Brussels it's understood that it doesn't make sense to try to duplicate the efforts that we already do. Um, so, meaning that basically the, the, also the Commission and, as mentioned, the Council Secretariat relies on our, our work. In addition, I think what is extremely useful for us to understand the situation, and especially in the, in the crisis situation, is, is the delegation reporting. As you know, EU has more than 140 delegations around the world, embassies, so to say, and they do provide very valuable, very, very valuable information, and we have access to pretty much all of that, that information available. Some of, of that, of course, is, is more important to us than, than others, and uh, that's also a bit of a, let's say, I would say, commission heritage, perhaps, that some of the, some of the uh, delegations deal with issues which are not of that much interest to common security and, and defense policy especially. And then open source is already mentioned, uh, hugely important and also uh, the, the, I would say that the key or the main challenge today is that in some of the crises that we see today uh, in the neighboring regions of, of, of Europe among others, there is a huge amount of disinformation involved as well, uh, both uh, uh, intentionally and mm -hmm. And, and then by default you have so many different tools today, all the way you know, from media to social media, etc. that you can, you can probably spread um, the disinformation relatively rapidly, or extremely rapidly to be honest. And, and that's also a key challenge for all the intelligence actors to, to identify and, uh, what is really the, the, the mm -hmm. truth behind what, what you see in, in, in uh, different sites, etc. But that's certainly something where, where we, let's say, uh, pay lots of attention to understand what type of sites, what type of social media do we look into, and, uh, and only in a way which is possible on, on without any covert operations that I have to again underline, because we don't have any right to do anything of that sort. 
And then when I talk about our customers or clients, I think this is also important to understand that it's not only the EU institutions, but all the member states do also receive all our assessments. Um, and especially for smaller member states with smaller intelligence communities, this is extremely important. There are always topics and always reports, assessments that these countries wouldn't have hand, or wouldn't get their hands on unless it would be provided by us. I know that very well. I come from a relatively small member state. I have been the director of the Finnish service for, for years and I know our competencies. We do have that in certain direction, but there are certainly many directions where we lack. The, the, the relevant information. And one thing which I also consider to be our key key task is to keep the political and security committee, the PSC or box, if you want to use the French abbreviation for it, that they would have all the 28 ambassadors around the same table have at least hints and assessment uh, to be used when they do decisions on, on whether it's a civilian or a military operation perhaps or CSDP mission to, to any, any part of the world or if they discuss topics today uh, which are of importance for them at least they would have a, a common common ground to build on and, and we have to be realistic the bigger member states always or the, all the ambassadors from bigger member states certainly would have additional information from, from their own services but at least there's something that they can, they can count on we also do a very close cooperation with other EU agencies, uh, namely Europol and, and Frontex. And uh, we share information, of course, according to the, the uh, rules we have for classified information, but it has also proved to be a very efficient way to understand uh, the different dimensions of different crises. Let's take the situation in North Africa, the migration, for example. For, for us, it's basically understanding the causes and trying to, to look into that while when working with Frontex, they might have a very clear understanding of what the current situation is on the ground and how that might change in, in, in a short or medium, medium term. Um, on the clientele side, as I said, we really try to be the, the one-stop one shop or hub for all that and, and also DG Home when preparing issues like uh, with DG move issues like uh, civil aviation, etc., we really try to try to assist them as well in our understanding. Uh, let's say of the threat in some of the third countries, it might be for civil aviation, might be an issue, or indeed more clearly the uh, uh, terrorism dimension to 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 the issue. One thing that we do combine, and this is quite unique, actually certainly unique globally but also in, in, in European context that we also combine the external and the internal know-how as I said we have security service colleagues dealing with counterterrorism mm -hmm. but we also have an understanding what what is going on in, in, in places like Syria and Iraq and while you combine those two aspects you come into a much more comprehensive picture but, but what might be the outlook for the future and how th things might change whether we talk about foreign fighters or all that type of uh, issues in, in, in principle. And also, as you can see, what, what is of great interest to us today uh, are things related to cyber security. Many people talk about hybrid warfare, whatever it means, but it, as I said about the disinformation, all the activities these days, especially military activities, do include, at least to a certain extent, uh, uh, information warfare, type of tactics and we are also very interested in, in, in having a look into that and how that might affect Europe and Europe's security. And so that I won't take too much of, of, of your time and that there will be time for questions. I will just end up with one, one more question. As many of you might have seen, there has been a discussion, at least there was a discussion after the Snowden revelations, whether there should be a European intelligence agency and whether it would be feasible. I already mentioned at the very beginning what Lisbon Treaty says about national security and many member states do interpret that the way that intelligence is a core part of, of national security and should be only the government of the member states. This would basically mean to a conclusion that actually uh, there's no chance, I mean politically or even legally, to, to build something which would be a European-wide uh, agency and I have to say that personally I 
do see huge difficulties also beneath that. There are issues which are more tactical in nature, which are linked to the supervision of intelligence activity. Who would be the supervisory body? Would it be the European Parliament? Would it be someone else? I don't know. Um, who would order the operations to be run? By whom and where? I mean, there are very many practical issues which I think and, you know, the devils in the detail, which I think are just as, as, as difficult to solve as those political and legal issues. So basically, my conclusion for the time being is that we will continue as it is, uh, the situation with intent, perhaps uh, widening, uh, the, the, let's say, the network, having even more colleagues, but the basic principle, basic rule would still apply to, to, to our activities meaning that the operational and tactical responsibilities with the member states and our work will be complementary in trying to assess the strategic level um, of, of different crisis situations in, in, in the, especially in the neighboring regions and of course according to, to, to our priorities. So indeed, I do not believe that there will be an EU's own CIA at, at any, any time soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. This was a very detailed presentation, Christiane. The, the temptation is to uh, to add on another 15, 20 minutes, but uh, if you could just uh, maybe focus on the counter-terrorism aspects, because a lot of the legal uh, the legal bases and so on have already been talked about. Christiane, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, exactly, that was what I was was planning to do just briefly, as not all of you are familiar with the, what is the European Counterterrorism Coordinator, who I work for. The European Council created that position after the attacks of Madrid uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, to have somebody who would coordinate all the various efforts in counterterrorism in the EU, who would make suggestions how can we improve in the future, what are the top areas we need to work on, and also to reach out to third countries and combine the internal and external aspects of the fight against terrorism. So the European Council has set the mandate of Gilles de who is, has been the coordinator uh, for the last seven years and who I work on. Um, we've heard a lot about this, uh, this uh, treaty uh, in the EU. And what's interesting is that that's the only area of government that remains outside uh, the EU competence, and there are meetings where European services meet, with, but which take place outside the, of the EU context. Um, one challenge, though, is there, because of the fact that national security is outside of the EU, how do the services influence the EU system when we discuss issues that are very important to them? For example, PNR, the passenger name record. That's something that the security community needs, but what you hear in the European Parliament is a lot of the voices of data protection and not so much of the other voices who could explain operational uh, needs. What's also interesting is that in the EU treaty, uh, on the other hand, you have a provision that says that the national uh, the countries can work together uh, uh, on this issue um, if that's regarded useful. And then you see uh, that internal security, where a lot of the counterterrorism uh, measures in the EU are being decided under now as a shared competence of the European Parliament. My question we have to ask ourselves first is what's the definition of intelligence? And it's not so easy. Uh, Ilka um, uh, has already spoken about the difference between operational and strategic intelligence. Strategic saying what's the threat more globally and operational meaning which person is a suspect plotting what specific action. Then the second uh, the difference is what is law enforcement information and what is intelligence information. And what was very interesting, there was a cargo plot in 2009 originating in Yemen, uh, where a plane uh, uh, that was detected in the British Midlands because information has been passed on. Now the same information has been given into the UK to the security services, so it was treated as intelligence it has been given to the Germans or another country and was treated uh, to the law enforcement agencies and that was treated as law enforcement information. So what is decisive? Is it the channel? 
uh, it's a question uh, you need yourself to ask. And then the concept which is important in counterterrorism is intelligence-led uh, uh, policing, where you also see that both uh, uh, law enforcement um, um, and intelligence need to work together uh, closely. Uh, information sharing is crucial in counterterrorism to prevent and detect uh, plots, to have a, a strong strategic analysis, and especially with the change threat today, where the terrorist groups are a lot more decentralized, where you have lone actors, where you have uh, the foreign fighters, where the threat has become a lot more diverse and a lot more difficult uh, to detect. And also you see that terrorist groups move across borders and recruit um, internationally. Now, um, I put in a few examples that are relevant uh, in the counterterrorism context where, the, where uh, uh, intelligence is relevant in the EU context. ICA has already said we are uh, customers of the INSEN, and it's really crucial for us to have the INSEN's analysis. So, uh, the written reports, which really inform the discussions that we are having on counterterrorism policy in the different working groups in the council. So that's really important. But also before the counterterrorism coordinator goes on trips, he is free uh, by a CAS team. So that's very, very useful for us to understand this, the threat in a strategic way. Then what's also interesting is that there are tools which are uh, uh, for information exchange. Uh, general information used for prevention, not law enforcement at the EU level, which is the terrorist financing tracking program uh, between the EU and the US, and the PNR agreement, which is under discussion now. And then um, there is the Schengen Information System, which is, um, which is a system because we don't have internal border controls inside the EU, but we have the border controls at the external borders. We have a system where police and security services can enter information so that um, suspicious persons can be uh, detected uh, and flagged, and that is for both security services and um, law enforcement. Now, how do we, uh, as in the CTC's office, relate to intelligence? Um, we don't have an operational role, we don't receive operational intelligence, but then we rely on the strategic uh, intelligence, and that's, that's really, really uh, very important uh, for us. And then also the, uh, what Ilka also mentioned, the open source, the reporting by EU delegations is crucial as well. Now to end, I'll do three quick case studies relevant to counterterrorism and intelligence. One, post Snowden. What was very interesting here was the EU, intra-EU debates because of the competence. As national security is outside the EU competence, how do we react to Snowden? And it was institutionally. And so it was decided to have two tracks. One track which would deal with data protection and privacy issues and the legal framework. And a working group has been set up between the EU and the US, where my boss participated, where the EES, including uh, ILCA, participated, and where the report is public, so you can see that on the website. And it was a lot about data protection and the, and the legal framework. And then there was a second track, and it's being referred to uh, in this statement uh, by the heads of state and government, where the member states themselves, if they so wish, wish discuss uh, 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 issues uh, uh, in their competence uh, with the United States. <coughs> um, what the EU also did was, on the request of the US, a contribution to the reforms, because President Obama uh, uh, wanted to review uh, surveillance policy. So a contribution was sent which stressed the importance of equal privacy rights and treatment for EU citizens and US persons, principles of necessity and proportionality, and remedies um, and oversight. And as you have seen since then, President Obama has announced his review and international interests and concerns figure uh, uh, in this reform. So uh, uh, that are important uh, steps. Um, and, and for the way forward, um, there is questions in, in various areas. For example, one of the instruments under discussion is the safe harbor agreement. It's about, uh, within that an agreement, an exception for national security. So the question is, how can you define that? <laughs> is, uh, and there are discussions ongoing between the Commission and the United States to have some reassurances uh, in that context. 
Then another important area is um, what we would call technological autonomy. A lot of the, the, the spying, so to say, can happen because the Europeans have lost um, their leadership in IT technology. And so we rely on components produced elsewhere and rely on data being held in companies that are, that are not uh, European. So wouldn't it be important to have more of an industrial initiative stimulating the EU IT and IT security industry? And then obviously member states are, are discussing this with the US. Second uh, topic is the foreign fighters. That's really the top, as Ilka also mentioned at the moment, the top security threat. And it's an area where sharing of information is extremely important. Why is that? Because the foreign fighters travel. I mean, they travel, often they travel to other member states, they travel to third countries, they travel to Syria, Iraq. So, of course, it's important to exchange um, information. The member states obviously have the primary role to uh, uh, act uh, uh, in the context of the foreign fighters problem. But uh, the Council and the European Council have decided that there are four areas where the EU can be useful in supporting the member states. One is this whole area of prevention and communication, because there's still lots of foreign fighters going. What can we do to counter the narrative of ISIL? How can we communicate so that the people are not attracted to go to Syria and Iraq? Then information exchange, I'll come to that. Investigation, prosecution of foreign fighters before they go there when they return and to be helping third countries to uh, increase their capacities in this context. Now, the challenge really is that, that a lot of this is about sharing of intelligence information. There is also sharing of, of law enforcement information. Europol has, the police, European police agency, has created what they call a focal point travelers on foreign fighters, where member states and certain third countries who are associated to that can uh, uh, provide information so that so that um, one can connect the dots, let's say. Um, and one of the challenges, uh, challenges is that for some countries, the, the line, let's say, between intelligence and law enforcement is different. So in some countries, it's more law enforcement information, and then a lot of it is shared with the focal point. In other countries, that's dealt with by the security services. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, it doesn't uh, go through the Europol uh, channels. There's a very interesting feasibility study done uh, at the moment, which is a model, a very uh, uh, innovative technology used by the network of financial intelligence units where you don't share information, but which somehow you have a network that connects and then you can have hits and only after that decide whether you want to share information or not. Uh, and that might be the solution also to, to be able to, to exchange more without any, any risk. Um, sharing of information is important between intelligence and law enforcement in the foreign fighters context, but also between the security players and social uh, uh, actors, local actors, for example, what are the returnees we should do rehabilitation programs with. One other area in the foreign fighters context where, where now we really uh, need to rely on all information, on intelligence, is the development of risk indicators in the Schengen context because there cannot be systematic checks for persons enjoying the EU right of crime free movement. So, they can, so the question is which person do you check? And for that we need good information. And now we have to see can we work on this all together to have this common uh, uh, risk indicators. Uh, that's the challenge for the future. And the last point I want to mention is the, is the CIA flights because that was very much also raised by the European Parliament and uh, they always ask the Council to investigate what member states have been doing and to provide goods for intelligence services. But as we have heard here a lot of times, there is in the treaties no EU competence for this, so it's not possible to do. However, what happened was that's still ongoing, the legal advisors of the EU and the US having a dialogue on the legal framework for the fight against terrorism, human rights law, uh, international humanitarian law, and so uh, uh, these uh, legal issues are being discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, that was a food for thought, indeed. Uh, <laughs>
I think uh, we're, uh, we're going to open up in a second to the audience, but uh, first of all, I have a follow-up question, and then I think Tommy Uta and our director also have one. So uh, let's uh, start with Tommy and me, and uh, and then we then we open up uh, to the floor. Tommy, what's your question? Uh, yeah, actually, Christian already mentioned that, Derek. So I would just like to repeat the that. Ah, oh, yes. See. Yeah, actually, what I uh, said in a kind of in my short introduction is uh, is that we well, take taking the issue with out from the institutional framework. So, in short, taking about the latest two three years, uh, it is a incident. So I'm sure that in the intelligence community, there's a certain kind of understood reality, but that was a major shock for the European big party. So was that uh, what were the changes and changes in demand or changes in requests for the European <coughs> intelligence community? Because you could expect that there's a new set of uh, you know new expectations, and especially take into account the current cri uh, crisis in Ukraine with uh, with Russia, where uh, the public debate basically is about what is the next move of Russia. So, so uh, uh, are these functioning uh, as some kind of accelerators or, or, uh, or is, is the institutional frame and that process the defining time? Um, okay, I'd like to add on this because it, it actually builds on this question. Now, I mean, the, uh, the big issue these days, yesterday and today, is obviously the U.S. Senate report on enhanced interrogation techniques. Now, I know that uh, neither the EU Intelligence Analysis Center nor the EU Counterterrorism Coordinator have any operational role. You emphasize that. But you do work with intelligence that comes from the member states, and you have no control over the exact nature of gathering that intelligence. So are there moral dilemmas involved in the activities of your institutions as well? It's, a, it's something that I think that, uh, that any kind of intelligence uh, bears with it the question of how was it gathered, were human rights standards kept um, while gathering it? And, uh, I think the answer to say, well, we have no operational role is maybe a too short answer. All right, if I should start and try to, to address these, these both questions. First of all, this Snowden issue, I think there's two dimensions to it. First one is the, let's say, countering, or the counterintelligence dimension of this question, that you know, how should European, whether it's EU member states or the European institution, how should they be prepared for, for possible intelligence operations coming from third countries? And certainly I would say that you know, this has been something which, which in the institutions and in, mem in many member states have been looked into, no question about that. I think that raised the awareness, but as Tommy referred to, I don't think that the capabilities of, of, of US, for that matter, or any other country, was that big of a surprise to, to people in this business? Probably to a certain extent, yes, it was, but I certainly think you know, we, we knew that these sort of operations do, do take place uh, globally. So this is, this is one thing. It certainly raised the awareness, although I have to say that I, when it comes to the EU institutions, I, I thought that there might be a, let's say, a wider window of, of, of uh, let's say, understanding what might take place and, and to be prepared for for any, any, let's say, hostile activity by any third country or so the institutions, but certainly measures have been, been taken. The other issue, more of the intelligence dimension, I mean, if, if I understood correctly, whether uh, it changed, uh, I mean, one, one, of the, one of the issues that was raised was exactly the idea of this uh, European intelligence agency in some way to counter the, the US uh, activities. I don't see that they would be countered by strengthening the intelligence capability of EU as such. It would be countered by strengthening the counter intelligence capabilities of EU. So that's that's not directly linked into that. Um, at the same time, you have to remember that some, or oh, actually quite many of third countries are also important partners for member states, intelligence community and security community. No question about that. That's the other side of the coin. 
Uh, EU intent, we don't work with third parties. We basically focus on, on, on the cooperation with EU member states, uh, with the extremely few exceptions. Then the, the moral dilemma, the question about how the intelligence is collected. Um, again, as I said, I have been in a relatively long time in an operational agency, one of the member states. And the only thing that I can say is on, on, on behalf of that service, and then what we do today, we would never ever use methods that have now been revealed by, by those reports. And I would also say that, although this is also a relatively short mm -hmm. answer, but we, as we can't, indeed, we can't assess how the intelligence is collected when the member states' services do share that with us. We just have to, you know, live to the expectation that they are collected according to the binding laws and regulations and, and, and international uh, treaties and contracts. So in, 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 in that respect, we, we, we have to take the assumption that, you know, the, whatever is shared with us is, is in accordance with the national legislation of the, of the service that provided it to us. And, and there's, no, there's no mechanism 